are you doing? Fight it! Get down! They only have spears, don't they? No! Machine guns! Oh! This isn't the Sudan? No! It's not 1898? No! Belgium 1914! So I should be down there with you then! Yes! Oh, come on. When the British Army sailed to South Africa in 1899, it did so full of confidence that things would be over quickly. This was not to be the case, and the Boers inflicted a series of stinging defeats upon the army that collectively became known as Black Week. These were not necessarily due to bad doctrine, as much as it was a lack of appreciation of when to apply it. In the situations that were presented, rarely has an army been placed on its heels so immediately and decisively. The learning process would begin in earnest nearly immediately, such that the capture of Pretoria in June of 1900 would force the formal surrender of the Boer state. The war would rage on, however, for another two years, as the Bitter Enders, as they were known, waged a guerrilla campaign that was tactically innovative and effective, but ultimately unsuccessful. There were many, many lessons learned from this conflict and the army embarked on a transformation nearly immediately upon its return home. Some lessons were interpreted correctly. Others were far too theater specific to be effectively applied elsewhere. Regardless, the years between 1902 and 1914 would see the forging of a tactically adept and superior shooting army. This would stand in the way of the juggernaut that was the German first army in 1914 and punch above its weight. I recently had the opportunity to stand and chat with Mike from Bloke on the Range about this most interesting and transformative era. We both thought you might enjoy the banter. Hello and welcome to Bloke on the British Muzzleloaders Range. I'm here with uh, Rob of the British Muzzleloaders Channel in rural Western Canada and uh, we thought we would uh, have a chat today about how we got from here to here. So thanks for hosting me. You're more than welcome. Pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. Like, pleasure to be here. Great honor to be able to work with the man himself. Right back at you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, right, so basically, um, Rob is equipped uh, as of the late 19th century. So we're talking Sudan, Boer War. I'm equipped as of 1914, First World War. And we were having a discussion and we thought that uh, it'd be interesting to sort of see how the lessons, discuss how the lessons learned from the, particularly the Boer War, got us from here to here. So, do you want to take us through uh, Certainly. where you are? So, let's start with the hardware first, shall we? Mm -hmm. So, I'm armed with a, uh, in this case, it's a Mark I Lee Metford that viewers of my channel will be uh, quite familiar with. But it's indicative of the type of rifle that was carried in, in the Sudan campaign of 1898. Mm -hmm. Uh, it fires the 303 cartridge. In this case, it's the early marks of the cartridge, mm -hmm. uh, which had a velocity of around 2,000 feet per second using a round nose 215 grain bullet. Uh, it is magazine fed. Uh, this particular model has an eight round magazine and it has a feature known as a mag cutoff, which uh, I personally on my channel have discussed in depth as well as on yours, as mm -hmm. I understand. So, uh, doctrine of the day regarding the weapon is single loading. Uh, with a magazine in reserve mm. for critical moments, mm. as it were. Uh, the enemy gets too close, uh, the enemy surprises you, you have an immediately available reserve with uh, a minimal amount of reconfiguration of the weapon that is at hand and can be delivered very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some, uh, many accounts, as a matter of fact, of the effectiveness in the right circumstances of this system in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, the caliber is 303, so... Anybody who shoots any manner of uh, Lee rifle will be uh, intimately familiar with the cartridge. As I mentioned, uh, it shoots in service. It shot a 215 grain bullet at 2,000 feet per second. Uh, not quite as fast as the ammunition that your rifle was intended to shoot, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll talk more about that in a bit. Yep. The equipment that I'm wearing is known as the Slade Wallace equipment or pattern 1888 valise equipment. 
Uh, it was the last generation of equipment made for the infantry in white buff leather, as you can see the color. Uh, at its most basic level, it carried 100 rounds, mm -hmm. uh, 50 in each of these pouches, which are of a later mark. Uh, in each pouch, there was 20 rounds loose, mm -hmm. uh, ready in for immediate availability, plus three packets of 10 rounds in each pouch. Mm -hmm. So each pouch was identical that way. Um, for its designed purpose, I think these pouches particularly uh, came about as a result of the previous pattern pouches opening from the front and up. Mm -hmm. And uh, this led to spillage of ammunition and, and mm -hmm. the loss of it. Uh, these pouches open forward, and especially when in the prone position or in any kind of uh, less than kneeling mm -hmm. or standing, shall we say, this helps prevent spillage and loss of ammunition with that lid automatically wanting to close mm. back on top. Because it's quite, it's quite cupped, actually. Yes. Uh, part of the design feature was uh, a slit cut in the side of the, the, the top of the mm. lid here, which then formed a somewhat of a rounded shape over mm -hmm. the top of the pouch. Uh, the, the design's not perfect, mm -hmm. uh, but in an era when ammunition was carried, loaded, and used uh, singly, mm -hmm. uh, this had a balance of loose rounds ready for availability mm -hmm. immediately, as well as the packets for mm -hmm. later, and uh, at a pause or a lull, those packets would be then produced, mm -hmm. unwrapped, and then placed in the loops inside mm -hmm. the pouch to replenish uh, those that were fired. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the rest of the equipment goes, it's pretty standard. There's a water bottle, as mm -hmm. most soldiers will carry, as well as a haversack for food and other small and sundry items. Mm -hmm. uh, things like this were obviously uh, uh, climactic, or in terms of theater-oriented, in a mm -hmm. hot, dusty desert and climate uh, such as the Sudan. Then uh, foreign service helmets protect this uh, head from the sun, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And a relatively lightweight uh, khaki drill tunic, mm -hmm. or frock, as the terminology of the day would indicate. Mm -hmm. And the usual rest of the gamut of a typical Highland soldier. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where did this go wrong in the Boer War? I mean, the, 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 the sort of popular view uh, was that the campaign was dominated, or that wasn't really quite the case, by long-range Boer marksmanship with 7mm model 1895 Mauser rifles, long rifles, in a sort of guerrilla war situation with a culture of marksmanship behind it. So there is a degree of truth to this. Um, that there were lots of long-range engagements. So British infantry doctrine of the era was rather more sort of typical colonial warfare set up for that. And uh, yeah, it. Well, you were telling me earlier it, it, the myth of sort of red coats lining up Napoleonic style and marching towards a, uh, a high peak with Boer marksmen well hidden behind uh, rocks. That's not really the reality is it? Uh, no and if you look at uh, some of the, uh, the the accounts of battle and anecdotes that the tactics of the late 19th century were uh, in the in a formal sense in terms of manuals and and doctrine uh, geared specifically and had been since the 1870s mm -hmm. towards uh, operations in extended order mm -hmm. and what this means is uh, instead of being lined up shoulder to shoulder mm -hmm. uh, and being packed close together Men are spread out, and by this time, uh, in, this, in fact, in a single rank, mm -hmm. at uh, anywhere up to uh, five paces between, four paces between men, mm -hmm. uh, but could then shrink down to uh, being quite close, one or two paces. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, extension was a fundamental part of army business. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to caveat, though, that the interpretation of the manual in terms of what was actually practiced, especially uh, in home service, so mm -hmm. in Great Britain, in the UK, uh, sometimes did not reflect the spirit of the regulation. Mm -hmm. So that it said to do things a certain way, and in practice they were uh, exercised generally similarly. However, uh, extension and the space between individuals mm -hmm. sometimes was relegated to... Uh, the textbook mm -hmm. and what you find and in fact there's there's pictures uh, taken of uh, troops on maneuvers in the uh, 1890s and you can see them although they are extended they're in a mm -hmm. single rank and maybe even in the kneeling position mm -hmm. uh, in the face of the enemy they are in fact about as close as we are here together mm -hmm. so that uh, to the modern eye of course is horribly bunched yeah uh, so despite the fact that extension um, multiple layers of uh, 
troops lined up, but at intervals of 200, 300 yards between these mm-hmm. lines uh, was prescribed mm-hmm. in the manual. But what we see in the Boer War is perhaps instances where those drills would have been known to all generals, uh, all field officers, mm-hmm. and all junior officers. But decisions at times were made where those uh, those drills, those evolutions, had been intended to uh, be adopted, but later in, say, the advance. Uh, mm-hmm. One particular example of that is the Battle of Magers Fontaine. Mm. Uh, a night advance was prescribed, and the orders stipulated that the battalions that were to engage uh, in that advance were to stay in close column mm-hmm. uh, for control purposes so that instead of extending in the middle of the night, and don't forget, this is the late 19th century, there was no such thing as you know luminous comp- compass dials uh, and this kind of thing. So maintaining control, cohesion, direction mm-hmm. was crucial to maintaining uh, or bringing those troops onto the enemy together mm-hmm. in a coordinated manner. And the decision was made then to advance in these close formations uh, to relatively close to the enemy. Mm-hmm. And what happened at Magras Fontaine is the fact that, first of all, the reconnaissance was poor, and they didn't realize that the Boers, instead of being on the top of the hill where they thought and they saw the, the dummy trenches, they were, in fact, at the bottom of the hill. Mm-hmm. And so when dawn broke, the Boers was, uh, were much closer. Mm-hmm. And this led to the, the tragedy that was the Battle of Magras mm-hmm. Fontaine, with the battalions of the Highland Brigade in particular being caught very close to the Boers, mm-hmm. who were then shooting... Uh, from a similar elevation mm-hmm. with uh, modern, I'm not going to say specifically Mauser rifles because at the ranges engaged, it wouldn't have really matter what rifle mm-hmm. you were shooting. But in particular, instead of shooting down on them, they were shooting across at them. Mm-hmm. Their fire was low mm-hmm. and it would have, uh, in modern parlance, it would have been grazing fire. It would mm-hmm. have carried on so that uh, somebody at the front would still be uh, uh, obviously in danger, and those at the rear would be in the same amount of danger mm-hmm. by the same bullet. Yeah. If it missed the, f- the guy in the front, it would have hit the person in the back yeah. because that bullet wasn't raising uh, mm-hmm. above the level of a man at those ranges. Mm-hmm. And you see a brigade of infantry put to ground in daylight in close proximity to the enemy. Mm. They can't move. They can't deploy. Mm. So despite the fact that the tactics of extension and the, the multiple layers, the firing line supports and reserve, that kind of tactical innovation was well known. It perhaps wasn't trained to the spirit of the mm-hmm. manual. Uh, and as a result, bad decisions, bad tactical decisions mm-hmm. were made by uh, generals and senior officers uh, and with the resulting tragedies. Mm. But it, I mean, let's just put it in context. People talk about the flat flying Boer Mauser cartridge. I mean, we're still in the round nose era. Uh, it's still a heavy bullet, even though it's seven millimeter. And it's doing twenty three hundred feet per second versus from, the two thousand of the uh, yeah. Lee Metford Lee Enfield. It's not a massive difference. No. And compared to modern ballistics, and when we get on to uh, this, uh, that's get, that, that's their modern ballistics, modern ideas of uh, of uh, flatness of trajectory but even in open order you can imagine advancing over open felt with Boer Ma- Bo- marksmen dug in that to a large degree uh, provided the, the the range judgment was good they must have been absolute sitting ducks uh, absolutely that uh, uh, nobody operated in that era on the battlefield alone mm. and despite the fact that uh, you may have been extended from your file mate to two or three or four paces mm. And as a side note, these lessons, although perhaps not uh, realized or remembered mm. at the beginning of the war, after those first serious defeats uh, mm. at the beginning of the war, there were some tactical navel-gazing, as it were. Yeah. And there were immediate and ultimately successful uh, uh, modifications and re-emphasis on some of these principles. Mm. So you see then, uh, towards the close of the, uh, uh, the formal campaign, before the guerrilla mm. campaign truly starts... Uh, massive extensions, mm. ten paces between individuals. Mm. Uh, you know something that is very uh, modern to the to the, the modern eye and mm. sensibility. Uh, and they found that this, in fact, worked. Massive extensions, and they could outflank the Boer positions. But also, the danger to the individual and the group was reduced significantly mm. by those extensions. Uh, it took a lot longer to get to where you wanted to go because, of course, with more extension, your firepower is limited. Mm-hmm. And in order to increase that firepower, we have to uh, adopt a bit more of a gradual 
a dominance of mm -hmm. whatever enemy position in coordination with the artillery and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, despite these setbacks at the beginning of the war, the tactics, the spirit, as I alluded mm -hmm. to earlier, seems to have been grasped uh, and combined with other tactical innovations mm -hmm. and those formal campaigns, those set-piece battles mm -hmm. uh, against the Boers when they were standing as an army mm -hmm. were ultimately successful. I mean, an another thing with the, with the, the length of ranges of, uh, of engagement, it was uh, discovered out there that uh, a lot of the magazine Lee Enfields, so the ones intended for cordite, uh, were extremely poorly sighted. They were. Uh, this is a, a problem peculiar to the magazine Lee Enfield versus the magazine Lee Medford. A small interjection here. I thought I would add this because it would seem that in the discussion coming ahead, a small tangent would take us away from the point that Mike was initially trying to make. You see, the sights of a magazine Lee Enfield were offset to a degree from the center of the bore. This was to compensate for horizontal drift, which was the tendency of the bullet to travel sideways as it flew through the air at greater ranges. These measures were found to be overcompensating, and there was a series of fixes, both in the field as well as at the factory, that were instituted on the rifles to correct this error. The error indeed was significant, and it could at times result in a rifle shooting as much as six inches to the right at 100 yards. The fixes worked, as indeed my rifle has been subjected to one of these fixes, which completely eliminated the problem. More on that on the Lee Metford playlist here on the channel. Mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, the rifles essentially are the same, except mm -hmm. for the pattern of rifling. Mm -hmm. And when they adopted the Enfield rifling, uh, it, it, because of the problems with the cordite uh, wearing out the Metford barrels, mm -hmm. uh, unbeknownst to anybody until they actually put it in practice. Yeah. And it's important to realize as a side note that we're talking many thousands of rounds here yeah. to, to wear out a Metford barrel. And the annual qualification of a soldier would put a uh, number of rounds, uh, you know, under a hundred. Yeah. So how many years of annual shooting in peacetime yeah. would it take to wear out a Metford barrel? Yeah. Uh, I think the popular conception is you put, you know, a, f a few rounds and maybe a hundred or two hundred rounds mm. through a Metford barrel and it's worn out, it's mm. useless. So what we see is in fact Metfords in use until the, uh, through the entire Boer War. Mm. Well, and in training in the First World War. Absolutely. Well, which is also why a lot of them are pretty shot out today, if you can find them, because they were shot with cordite during, what, during the Boer War, between the wars. I mean, they were obviously uh, phased out progressively, but they, they've been relegated to training during, during World War I, even. Now, uh, once we get up to here, people accuse our channels of being Lee Enfield fanboys. Um, well, uh, <clears throat> some more than others. Yes. Anyway, um, let's just say that the magazine Lee Metford and the magazine Lee Enfield were in no way, shape or form the best rifles on the battlefield there. The, uh, the 1895 Mauser beats the pants off them because charger loading. Absolutely. That more than velocity and yep. you know, sharp shooting, that in itself is the crux yep. of the matter. The ability to reload five rounds in one go and not uh, not have to stuff them in one at a time. This really is the crux of the matter. And uh, if I was parachuted back in there and you put one or other in front of me and I could choose, I would take the Mauser, even though it's got a sticky out bolt handle, I will be able to take in a position and deliver much more sustained, accurate fire with that than with that A, better sighted, B, B, though they're both practical, practical uh, grouping size doesn't really make a lot of difference because the weak link in the chain is normally the shooter, certainly under combat conditions, but just charger loading. You can just keep it up here. Once your magazine's out, you're down to single loading until you've got time to stuff round after round in there. And you know that in some ex experience that I've con conducted is that it is faster to continue with single loading. Yep. Perhaps if you're in a static position, uh, withdrawing a packet of ammunition and laying it beside you, knowing mm -hmm. you're going to be there for a while and using it that way is much faster than rebombing the magazine, yep. firing the magazine, rebombing it mm -hmm. and firing it in that regard. So, so once you've exhausted that initial reserve, yep. you have to just maintain 
it, the magazine comes completely out of the picture. Mm. Now, it's, there's a sort of chicken and egg question as to what, because the, the doctrine was based around the, the non charger loaded magazine. Uh, timing wise, uh, the Lee Metford predates any, any adoption of charger loading. So, um, I mean, the first, off the top of my head, uh, the first actual charger loaded rather than Mannlicher on block clip loadings come in in about 1889. There's the, uh, the Belgian Mauser and then the Schmidt Rubin 1889 comes in a couple of years later. Um, and that's really, it's a game changer, but they're committed to the, to the concept. It's, it's not really so much of an issue in the sort of colonial warfare that was, that was, that was dominating. Which to be fair is, as you say, dominating. That is, especially the army of the era, that is its primary function is policing mm. the empire. Mm -hmm. And do they need charger loading? Everything up to that date, including uh, the Battle of Omdurman in 1898, mm -hmm. uh, shows that the current doctrine, the current weapons, mm -hmm. are eminently effective. Yep. I mean, we're, we're talking poorly armed, poorly equipped, massed armies advancing typically over, in, in this period, it's typically in open, in open country in, uh, in, in Africa. I mean, the, uh, the northwest frontier of India is, there's not, it was always dodgy, always things going on, but really the colonial warfare of the era was the Sudan and so on was that open uh, one, notwithstanding mm. the, 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 the lessons that were learned but not necessarily recognized at an army level uh, from the Pathan revolt of 1897 mm. on the northwest frontier and that really was the watershed of the development of improved tactics and as a result uh, uh, weaponry it, mm. it wasn't something that happened overnight but when you look at the because uh, the 1897 revolt was the first a uh, true test of mm -hmm. the small bore, in this case, 303 mm -hmm. uh, magazine rifle. And there were some things that were found to be somewhat lacking, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that pertained to the, the, the tactics uh, that were used in terms of the delivery of the musketry. Uh, in general, however, the rifle performed well. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did have uh, to face were tribesmen that, were not just the sword and spear armed masses mm -hmm. that they were relatively well armed. Mm -hmm. And that is really the first time that a colonial power, with the exception of the Boers in the 1880s, mm -hmm. uh, that a colonial, or sorry, a, 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 a native power, if you will, it has not comparable weaponry, mm -hmm. but enough to make a sting felt. Yeah. And for individuals and pe people and organizations to I can't even say wake up, mm -hmm. but certainly it's recognized at some levels and especially by the army in India mm -hmm. that something's changing here. Mm. So, I mean, coming out of the Boer War, the, uh, the, the main lessons in terms of the rifle were charger loading. It was just like absolute must. There's no question anymore, um, which has an influence on the doctrine as well. Individual sighting of the rifles, both at the factory and to the soldier, if to the individual soldier, if needed, if, if he could shoot well enough uh, to be to be permitted to zero his own rifle if it was if it was off, and the short rifle, the universal short rifle. Um, what you also see in the in the Boer War is mounted infantry carrying long lees on horseback, yes, riding to battle, dismounting and fighting dismounted. Uh, so when we put these three together we get the uh the i mean this is this is the sort of main smle model the final one charger bridge on here we didn't get there in one step there's all sorts of other um uh, contraptions with a uh, sliding charger guide on the uh on the mark one uh the cutoff comes in and out of doctrine uh comes in and out of of the models but they liked it i've done a video explaining what the the, the purpose of of this was but, but uh, uh, maybe to sum that up on on this rifle the cutoff is a uh gives you a modicum of control of mm -hmm. the fire yep whereas a cutoff fitted to an smle is what kind of feature simply um a luxury feature sure <laughs> but perhaps perhaps maybe a safety feature yeah as opposed to something that governs the tactics and the operation of the rifle yeah this does not have one this is a mark three star simplified one this particular one is um, 1916 
So an early Mark III star. Um, the Brits have this concept, still do, of loaded but not made ready. Last seen as late as the number four trials rifles in the early 30s. As I said, it came back and in and in and out of, uh, of, uh, of fashion. But um, and the universal short rifle, um, about the same time the US did the same thing with the 1903 Springfield, 1903, in fact, SMLE Mark I is 1903. Parallel development, similar reasons. Uh, the cavalry, the Leonfield and Lee for cavalry carbines are really quite short and light and not very accurate and uh, puts you at a massive disadvantage. Um, you've got the lessons learned from mounted infantry, so uh, give everyone this, train everyone to shoot to the same standard, and, uh, and, and crack on. Um, now, in terms of the equipment, as soon as you get to chargers, you need a way to carry them. Um, here, we end up with uh, pouches for 150 rounds, although doctrinally a full ammo load was 120. Which we've not quite worked out why. No. And that's, of course, notwithstanding the, the use of greatly excessive numbers of rounds carried by individuals for certain operations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once, once you get into it, if you look at First World War era uh, photos, you'll see people with 150 rounds and then one or two 50 round bandoliers as well. Um, big problem here, in the Boer War, there was a lot of ammunition being dropped, uh, not only from these pouches, which do have holes in them, but there were lightweight cloth bandoliers that were worn. They were, weren't, in, it was a question of whether they were actually intended to be worn like that, but uh, the Boers could just go along behind British columns and pick up tons and tons and tons of 303 ammunition. And what's in interesting is that the, this is canvas webbing, but the experience with the lightweight disposable canvas bandoliers biased the, uh, the army structure against the use of webbing. This, we didn't get from there to there immediately. There's an intermediate set of equipment, the uh, 1903 bandolier equipment, um, which also held 100 rounds, but uh, sort of characterized by, uh, for infantry, a 50 round bandolier, and then another 50 rounds in, uh, in 10 and 15 round pouches on the belt made of leather. And you've got some experience with, uh, with this. I've never seen a full set of it in my life. The bandoliers are quite cool and they're seen as late as the Second World War for drivers and things like that. But the entire equipment really isn't. Once it was adopted, I think it was that immediate post-Boer War navel gazing. Uh, saw, the end of the war saw the massive use of bandoliers of many patterns. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was thought that this was the way forward. Mm. This, uh, the Boers carried their ammunition bandoliers, and the, the uh, imperial forces, uh, British and uh, empire forces that fought in South Africa, also mm -hmm. ended up carrying their ammunition and bandoliers. Of course, uh, those would have been uh, a setup for single rounds. So in this post-war era, they thought, well, bandolier is the way to go. Mm. But single rounds aren't. Mm. So this results, of course, in that very iconic five-pouch bandolier mm -hmm. and nine-pouch for the cavalry. Yep. Uh, but those are designed to hold chargers, the individual wide pouches across the chest and on the belt, of course, as you've discussed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's very found very quickly that it's a very ill-balanced and not a, a very functional set of equipment. Mm. It doesn't have much in the way of utility. There's no apart from the haversack, which is a separate piece in that particular mm. set of equipment, there is no utility pouch, as it were. There's no mm. valise, there's no small pack. Uh, this is seen as something that uh, becomes increasingly important, uh, that despite the fact of lightening the load of the mm. infantry, there's physically no other way to carry all the things that you might carry with the 1903 pattern equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, they see it is deficient in that way. Mm. And so what we see is the Army's reassessment of its adoption, or shall we say readoption, of the canvas or cotton webbing, which results in the iconic uh, World War I set of equipment known as the 1908 pattern web equipment. And this has, uh, as mentioned, capacity for 150, although perhaps less was carried as far as uh, regulations go. But it has uh, features of it that the 1903 and earlier patterns simply do not. And the, the biggest feature is apart from the uh, uh, 
ability to carry chargers is the fact that it is one piece of equipment when mm. assembled. That there's nothing crossing the chest, as you can see here, water bottle, haversack, uh, which is separate pieces unto mm. the set of equipment. Here, those individual pieces of equipment are attached to the uh, and suspended from the belt. There is a valise or, or large pack carried on the rear and a haversack uh, for the same purposes of uh, as haversacks in the past, but to carry food and other small items mm -hmm. like that. So it is by far the most advanced set of equipment used and fielded by the armies going into World War I. Mm. And it lasted until the eve of World War II before it was replaced, but we'll get onto that another time. Now, uh, just uh, we've uh, been blathering on quite a long time. It's been fascinating. It's, uh, love talking to people who are also enthusiastic about that kind of thing, and particularly when they know more than I do about the particular period we're talking about. It's always a good learning experience. But uh, doctrinally, we went away from sort of volley firing, firing on command, to still relatively tightly controlled, certainly compared to other armies, but independent firing, independent reloading. Um, it was the, the, after the load, of, the load command was given and the fire orders would be, for instance, uh, a target indication and a range indication, five rounds fire at the standard rate, or five rounds rapid fire, or just fire. So just keep firing until told to stop. And, and so on and uh, there's no point in going into massive detail here because Rob's done a fantastic uh, uh, um, presentation of every aspect of this in as much geeky detail as uh, is humanly possible and uh, again without going into too much detail it wasn't arrived at immediately there's a there's a sequence of uh, sort of intermediate steps that get us up there just as the rifle advanced in increments over the various models from there to here the doctrine did as well and then the eve of world war world war one we've got uh, the frontline army equipped mostly with uh, mark three smles which was introduced in uh, 1907 cited for 303 mark seven ammunition a spitzer so pointed flat based bullet 174 grains at 2240 feet per second after out of this uh, shorter barrel um, and uh, occasionally you get it's a very silly, pointless argument. My, my country's vastly overpowered cartridge is, uh, is uh, more vastly overpowered than your country's vastly overpowered cartridge. Oh, wait a minute. I think we're getting a little uh, we're getting political here. I may have to step back. <laughs> I, I'm in solidarity with you. Yeah, it's like they're all overpowered. I mean, yeah. uh, that, that really is, sums it all up. Yeah. That, especially with hindsight, yeah. yes, they are all massively overpowered. <laughs> But we were thinking, what were you cited to on the dial site on this? Um, 2,800 yards. I mean, it, this, I, I doubt these dial sites were ever actually used in anger, but they had the ballistics, so they thought, why don't we cite the rifles uh, for it? But, uh, I mean, that was retained. Uh, it was on the, 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 the early P-14s, that's as late as it was retained. And that's, there, there are... There are the Brits weren't the only ones to have this kind of long-range sight, but their actual practical utility was probably zero. Um, little, one more weaponry aside, the, the Patton 13, the 7mm rifle that was converted into, into the P-14 in 303 during World War, World War I as an emergency, uh, emergency uh, reserve arm, that came out of this long-range thinking. And if you think these are massively overpowered, we were talking a 160 five grain um, seven millimeter bullet at 2800 feet per second and the and the the, the metallurgy and the powder uh, technology of the era couldn't hack that now this is actually a 280 uh, Remington I think if I'm wrong I'll correct myself uh, standard hunting load out of a case that's basically a 3006 case more or less necked to seven millimeter not a problem now you can easily do those kinds of ballistics but in the pre-world war one uh, era it was, uh, it was out, but that came out of that Boer War experience thinking. That uh, the, the Empire forces had been on the receiving end of Boer fire, mm. uh, that it was effective, and it was effective at very long range. Mm. But don't forget, we are talking about groups of people, mm -hmm. sometimes large groups of people, in the hundreds and whatnot. Yeah. And it's not a single individual necessarily 
finding and locating mm -hmm. somebody at 1500 yards yeah. but they know that the enemy is at about 1500 yards sights are set to 1500 yards mm -hmm. and you can aim at features that are nearby yeah. or at the actual mass or in the case of a, a, an extension of troops mm -hmm. but you can see where they are and very much in the same sense uh, of the role of machine guns later mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. even from the boar side yeah that their rifle fire is effective at these long ranges due to these factors mm -hmm. uh, of course the longer the range the, f the higher the trajectory uh, I'm sorry, the, the higher the velocity, the lower the trajectory, mm -hmm. the easier it is to hit a target. Mm -hmm. Even if you're not necessarily aiming specifically at that little mm -hmm. tiny black dot at these extended ranges, the effect of the mast rifle fire mm -hmm. puts a beaten zone yep. on top of your enemy. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a very dangerous place to be, mm -hmm. whether you're lying down or standing up. Mm -hmm. And as a result of this, how do we counter that? Yep. We need something that shoots even flatter, that shoots even faster. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, how do we do that? We just make something bigger and beefier, but the rifle can't handle it. Yeah. The metal can't handle yep. that increased uh, velocity and friction. So, mm. so uh, yeah. And then uh, First World War intervened. I, my view on that whole thing is it was never going anywhere because once you've, once you've wound the ballistics back down to a dull roar, say 20, uh, 2600 feet per second, you're getting 160 feet per second more than this. And But we've just adopted in 1910 this new cartridge and the rim jam issue is non-issue non uh, anymore and because we've fixed all of that, it's, it's all fixed. What, what do you mean we want to retool for this, for this entirely new thing? Um, but we've got forces all over the place and now, nah, uh, and then war were declared and forget about it. I think I've heard that somewhere. Possibly. I might be repetitive sometimes. Anyway, if you survived this far, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much, Rob. It's been a fascinating discussion. I've enjoyed every minute. Okay. And there are many minutes of it to uh, enjoy by this stage. It must be about 40 or something. Anyway, apologies for that. Please, uh, uh, if you haven't already liked and subscribed to both of our channels, British Muzzle Loaders and uh, Bloke on the Range, please do so. We're both on Patreon. So uh, please consider supporting us and uh, see you again sometime. Bye. Bye. Both Mike and I hope that you enjoyed the discussion. We certainly did engaging in it. For viewers of this channel, there will be a follow-up video in the form of another installment of the Firepower series, which will examine the differences between the Lee Metford and the SMLE, namely in that one feature that was salient in all the developments coming out of the South African War. Charger loading. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below.